Okay, hello. My name is Herb Hazen from Radnor Township Board of Health, and welcome to another in our occasional series of programs entitled Radnor Health Matters. Today we are going to talk about West Nile virus and um, some of the accompanying issues. And my guest today, and thank you for coming, is Dr. George Avedian, who is a physician in private practice, senior medical advisor to the um, Delaware County Council, and uh, very importantly for us in Radnor Township, he is also a resident of our township. So uh, welcome, Dr. Avedian. Thank you for having me. Let's start off by telling our viewers, uh, what is West Nile virus? Well, obviously, it's a viral illness. West Nile virus has a very interesting history. It's been implicated in the death of Alexander the Great. Apparently, at the time of his death, there were many birds that were found to be dead, and some historians have attributed his death to uh, West Nile. <clears throat> However, if we fast forward in history, around 1937, there were some studies being conducted in Uganda, and they were studying yellow fever. And at that time, a 37-year-old female had febrile illness, was evaluated, and was found to have West Nile. The location was in the West Nile district of Uganda, and hence the name. Now we can fast forward a little further and come to 1999, where the first case was identified in the United States. It was identified in the borough of Brook Brooklyn, no, I'm sorry, Queens. It was Queens, New York, in the uh, College Park area. And that was the first human case in the United States. Since that time, it's been identified in all 48 of the continental United States. It's identified in Canada and Mexico, the Caribbean, <clears throat> Central America. The only areas that it really hasn't uh, been seen as of yet are Alaska and Hawaii. Um, it is found throughout Europe and, of course, throughout Africa. How, how is it spread from one person to another? West Nile is spread through the bite of a mosquito. <clears throat> it is not spread from human to human. So if I had West Nile virus, I would not be able to give it to you through direct contact. What happens is the mosquito bites the individual, introduces the virus, the virus replicates, and the individual potentially can come down with West Nile fever. West Nile virus can also be transmitted in other fashion. It could be transmitted through blood transfusions, However, all blood transfusions in the United States are screened, so we don't see that. <clears throat> uh, it's also been implicated to pass from mother to child through breast milk. Um, the main threat in our area is the mosquito, and it's uh, two strains of mosquito, Culex pipiens and Culex restuans. Huh. Is this a, a seasonal occurrence? And if it is, which season is, um, is, the, is the worst for the spread of this disease? Sure. It is a seasonal occurrence, typically spring to fall. We'll see it as early as April. We can see it up through October. Usually that first hard frost will kind of clear out the... Uh, uh, the threat and the mosquito population will significantly dwindle. The peak activity would be in August and September. So right about now, uh, this is coming towards the, the end of the peak activity? That is correct, yes. What, uh, if a person does become infected and becomes ill, what would be the symptoms that that person would show? Basically, 80% of individuals that are bitten by a mosquito and the West Nile virus is introduced, 80% of them are asymptomatic. No symptoms at all. They'll have a mosquito bite, but beyond that, there'll be local irritation and that's it. Of the remaining 20%, the overwhelming majority are gonna have what's called West Nile fever. And that's basically a viral febrile type illness. Uh, individuals will have fever, 
It can be associated with a rash. Typically, the rash will be on the chest, the abdomen, and the back. Uh, they can have swollen glands, um, occasionally muscle aches and pains, a little malaise. In the more severe and more concerning case, one out of every 150 individuals will get what we call neuroinvasive disease. And that's either encephalitis, inflammation of the brain, or meningitis, which is an inflammation of the lining of the brain and spinal cord. That is a much more severe scenario. <clears throat> Symptoms may include stiff neck, severe headache, lethargy, stupor. Uh, they can have seizures and convulsions. It can advance into coma and potentially be lethal. So there is, in fact, a range of symptoms, as you've just described them, um, from none possibly to very, to very serious. But how soon after um, possible infection would a person become ill? After the mosquito bite, as little as three days and up to two weeks typically would be the period where you could develop symptoms, if you were going to develop symptoms. And how, how would it be treated if a person had these symptoms and went to a physician? Sure. <clears throat> Obviously, the asymptomatic patient is not going to seek treatment. There's no symptoms. <clears throat> Those that have the febrile illness would be treated just like a flu or a minor virus. You'd take either an antipyretic, acetaminophen, aspirin, ibuprofen for the fever, for the aches and pains, and just let it ride. <clears throat> of course, if there's any concern, I encourage anyone at any of those signs and symptoms to discuss it with their physician. The more advanced, more severe neuroinvasive disease, and the overwhelming majority are going to require hospitalization and uh, management by uh, not only um, infectious disease, but probably by neurologists and uh, you know, the entire spectrum of the um, medical system. So if someone thought, for, for example, after seeing this program, that they had West Nile, had become infected with the West Nile virus, what should they do? If anyone has any concern, they should contact their physician. Um, set up an appointment, be evaluated, and uh, you know, discuss their symptoms. Um, in this day and age with our computers and Google and Internet, uh, <clears throat> unfortunately too many people try to self-diagnose, mm -hmm. and usually they err on the side of something more severe, and you know, a lot of what we see is relatively benign, fortunately. Who, uh, which segments of our population are at higher risk? Is it the young, the elderly, or both? Or? With West Nile, it typically is um, more of the older population, those over the age of 50. Of course, anyone with a compromised immune system, AIDS patients, patients undergoing chemotherapy or that have autoimmune diseases, they're also at risk. Is pregnancy a risk factor? Pregnancy in and of itself is not a risk factor, no. <clears throat> what, what is being done at the national, state, and local levels to deal with this problem? It's being dealt with on all fronts. And at the national level, we have the Center for Disease Control that's really involved. Um, the, if you look at the geographic distribution of West Nile, it's predominantly found in six states those six states being, and two-thirds of the cases are in those six states, Texas, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Michigan, South Dakota, and Louisiana. Those are the six. Of those six states, 40% is within Texas. So that's why Texas is seen on the news a lot. Um, what the CDC does is it gathers information on the national level and then puts out information to the states and also it's available um, to the, uh, on the local level. The preventative measures are what are emphasized. As with most public health concerns, the best intervention is prevention. And the CDC as well as the state um, um, Department of Health and the various medical societies and the county Department of Health 
all try to get out the message of prevention. Now, Dr. Avedian has mentioned the um, National Centers for Disease Control and Prevention called the CDC, and uh, the CDC does have a website uh, for those interested in getting some more of the information that uh, Dr. Avedian has alluded to, including the map, um, the national map showing uh, the distribution of, uh, of cases. Um, uh, the CDC's website is www. Dot cdc dot gov and a little later I'll provide some additional uh, websites for those interested in getting some more information. Uh, my understanding, Dr. Vedian, is that there is currently no vaccine for um, prevention of West Nile uh, virus. Is one being worked on, do you, do you know? Uh, there is no human vaccine. In the veterinary population, there is a vaccine that is used in, in horses. It's an equine vaccine. Um, and it's only indicated for horses, not for other forms of livestock or animals. There is none as of this date in the human population, but my understanding is there's a lot of research being conducted in that, uh, in that arena. Mm -hmm. Well, what can a person do to prevent themselves because as you've mentioned already and as with so many other diseases, prevention is really the best way to uh, maintain one's health. Uh, so what, what can a person do? The preventative measures are obviously um, to minimize the mosquito population and to minimize the possibility of um, a mosquito bite. So to try to control the mosquito population, all standing water should be removed from properties. And standing water can be found in, in a gutter that is not functioning, a bird bath that is just sitting there not being used. Uh, you know, there's uh, recycling bins for trash that sit outside and collect water and, and they could become breeding, breeding sources. Small ponds that don't have adequate aeration or activity are sources of uh, um, breeding for mosquitoes. So we need to take away all the stagnant water. That's number one. Number two, if you need to be outdoors, try to avoid outdoor activity at dawn and dusk. Mosquitoes are most active at dawn and dusk. And unless it's absolutely necessary to be outdoors at that time, it's best to stay in. If you need to be outdoors, obviously protect your skin. Cover as much of your skin with you know, light colored, loose clothing. Um, the skin that is exposed, uh, there are uh, repellents out there that can be utilized. And uh, you know, obviously use that. If you're gonna be out camping, it's very wise to take a, a repellent with you. Some people are concerned about the um, one of the components of insect repellent, uh, DEET, and think that that is potentially harmful. Do you have a comment on that? Well, um, I've had uh, this discussion with you, Herb, as well as with some of the commissioners, and um, it's a two-edged sword. <clears throat> you have the uh, dilemma of the mosquito, and then you have the potential toxicity of uh, an insect repellent. Um, it's, it's a benefit and risk ratio, and, and when the mosquito population is, is sufficient, sufficiently high and the threat to the population is great, there it warrants use of an insect insecticide. And um, the half-life of the insecticide is very, very um, short. So my recommendation, and I, this is a recommendation I uh, expressed to your um, members of your uh, council, avoid outdoor activity for about a half hour period. Keep pets indoors, keep the children indoors. Uh, if you have an organic garden, just cover it, and then you can remove the cover after, you know, the next morning, whatever. So, you know, my, my fear is more of the mosquito than of the, the uh, insecticide. And as you point out, it's a benefit and risk analysis, and sometimes the risk of not using it um, outweighs any potential. The risk is a public health threat. Yeah. 
And it doesn't penetrate into the soil. You know, it, it, it's basically a very thin coating and, and it uh, has a very short uh, lifespan. Now on August 29th, um, Radnor Township experienced the spring. Um, was that for um, larval, uh, for the mosquito larvae, or for adult mosquitoes? Adult mosquitoes. Adult mosquitoes. How, do we know yet how effective that was? It was effective. <clears throat> What happens is we have a pre-control surveillance and a post-control surveillance. <clears throat> and how that works is, in a pre-control surveillance, you have traps set. And then the traps are, uh, for example, there'll be a central trap, and then maybe at a half mile radius, there'll be other traps, and then a one mile radius. And you look at activity in those traps. <clears throat> if all the traps are active, it tells you it's widespread. Whereas if it's just one or two, and it's it's more localized. They can determine the amount of activity in a trap, both pre and post. Mm -hmm. And pretty much with every uh, treatment that we've had in Delaware County on the post surveillance, there's been a significant diminished uh, population. So in your view, is the message um, about West Nile virus getting out to the general public, uh, what they need to do and what the issues are? We've been trying very hard, Herb. Um, <clears throat> myself, um, I have a Facebook and Twitter account. Every time there is a spraying in the county, I post it on, on those accounts. Uh, at the level of Delaware County Council, Councilwoman Maroon has gotten up on several occasions and expressed the uh, concerns regarding West Nile. Uh, our public relations department has issued several press releases on this uh, topic. Uh, myself, I've been in, interviewed on, on the television and radio. Uh, my colleague in the Intercommunity inter Health Department, Maureen Hennessy Herman, <clears throat> she's been interviewed in, in the print media. Uh, we have attempted to saturate the community with information. And again, it goes back to what I said earlier. It's the old Benjamin Franklin uh, saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Sure, absolutely. Um, now, in terms of um, of this widespread public information and public education effort, I mentioned before the uh, CDC's website www.cdc.gov, but the uh, state health department also has a website with important information, and. Uh, we can access that by going to www.westnile.state, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> dot state, dot pa, dot us. And at the county level, it's www. Dot <coughs> excuse me, co. Dot Delaware. Dot pa. Dot us. The, uh, <clears throat> the website for the county has links to all the uh, other pertinent websites that you just mentioned. And the, the most informative uh, of those websites, I think, is the uh, uh, Department of Environmental Protection. Um, a lot of useful information. As a matter of fact, I checked it uh, just before we went on the air. And it gives you the breakdown as to the... Uh, various counties in the state that uh, are being surveyed and then within the county it breaks it down to each municipality and the level of activity and the date of activity in that municipality. So for example if a, a resident of Radnor was concerned as to what is happening as far as um, activity with West Nile within uh, Radnor Township it's all outlined on that, uh, on that website. I apologize for the uh, <clears throat> spate of coughing there, but I want to uh, reiterate the uh, the county's website, which uh, I might not have gotten out so clearly. It's www.co.delaware.pa.us. Anything further that our viewers need to know? I think we've pretty much covered West Nile very well here. Um, the good news is as the cold weather comes, this is going to become less of an issue. However, there will be cases that will be continued to be reported 
because there is a little lag period there. Um, we've been quite fortunate uh, in the uh, entire county. We have had, according to the website, three cases of uh, neuroinvasive West Nile. Um, I believe it should be four, but you know I'm going by their data. And uh, if we go statewide, there's been about 20 cases. Uh, unfortunately, there's been one death in the state of Pennsylvania, and that was a an 82-year-old gentleman in, in Luzerne County. There's also been one death in our neighboring state of New Jersey. So <clears throat> it's something to be taken very seriously, and um, you know, fortunately, we're approaching the uh, season where it'll become a uh, history for us. For this year, anyway. For this year, correct. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ravidian. It's been the most informative uh, session. And thank you for joining us today. I hope you've um, benefited by the information provided and uh, we look forward to uh, your participation in future Radnor Health Matters programs. Thank you. Thank you.